hear me? All right, good morning. Uh, I'm Louis Perna. I'm a co-founder and chief scientist at Axion Systems Incorporated. I want to say thank you to everyone at Hello Tomorrow for having me here in France. Uh, and I want to say thank you to the universe that I'm standing on this amazing salt stage and I'm not a snail. That would go very poorly for me. Um, so I'd like to talk to you today about ion propulsion. Uh, that's what I'm an expert in. And why is that the next big thing for satellites? There is an extremely simple answer to this question, and it's this. Now, I'm not just going to leave you with this because without explaining it, there's not really much to say. But I want you to pay attention to those letters on the far right, the delta V and the VE, and how they relate to our final answer in this equation. But first, let's start talking about satellites. So what is a satellite? Uh, I think almost everyone here probably knows what it is. It's a tool. It's an extension of our capabilities here on Earth that we're putting in space to help us answer questions and accomplish goals. The types of satellites that traditionally have gone into space look like the one I was just showing in this one. They're large. They're the size of automobiles or school buses. They're very expensive, uh, but they're extremely capable. They're the things that have brought us all the pictures of Earth that we're familiar with. Uh, has my audio gone out? OK. Uh, they're the things that help us communicate on a day-to-day -day basis. They help us navigate. Um, but the last big thing that happened in satellites was that we changed from these large ones to much, much smaller ones. What's gone on in the industry over the last 10 to 15 years is what we're calling the small satellite revolution. We're taking the advancements that have been made in computing technology and cramming all the capability of large satellites down into something that fits in the palm of your hand, or maybe the size of a refrigerator, or sometimes even smaller, the size of a credit card. Now, this is much cheaper to make and to put into space than an, a satellite the size of an automobile. And so if you took the same budget and applied it to satellites this size, you could make several of them. You could make tens, hundreds, or even thousands of these types of satellites. And people are doing this. In fact, on uh, the most recent Mars mission, the Marco satellites that went out were this size of satellite providing communications capabilities to that mission. So billion dollar class missions are starting to use small satellite technology. Uh, a lot of people are starting to use small satellite technology because they want to do the same things that we've done before. Take pictures of the Earth, but take more of them. When you have a one satellite going around the Earth, you can only take so many pictures. If you put a hundred or a thousand of them, you can get a picture of every spot on the planet more than once a day. You can take these pictures in optical frequencies, infrared, and UV. You can start tracking the health of the planet. You can start tracking the health of commerce, the evolution of economies around the world. You can track and predict crop outcomes and how much shipping is going on. And you can start doing humanitarian things with all of this capability of monitoring national, uh, natural disasters, responding to them more efficiently, and helping people in times of critical need. But the thing that's probably driving the most activity is the promise of small satellite telecommunications. So being able to provide the same internet that you have in your phone to you anywhere on the planet with the same quality regardless of uh, how close you are to something like a cell phone tower. And so people have been putting billions of dollars into this idea. Uh, this graph is showing the investment in space since, well, 1969, but really since about 10 years ago when the new space economy really started kicking off. And 412 companies have been invested in to the tune of $18 billion. And a lot of this is going into the idea of telecommunications. So let's talk about how many satellites have been launched. Since Sputnik, about 8,400 satellites have gone into space. 2,000 of those are still operating today. So over that many decades, we're only at 2,000. In the next four years, it's predicted that as many as 2,800 will go up in addition. So we're going to more than double the number of satellites in space. And over the course of the next decade, Two companies, SpaceX and OneWeb alone, plan to have 9,000 actively operating satellites in space. So things are accelerating at an amazing pace. 
But I'm not here to talk about satellites. I'm here to talk about propulsion and why that's the next big thing. So in propulsion, generally, we're talking about, for space things, rockets. So why do you need rockets when you're in space? You're already there. So first of all, you need to use them to get off the planet into orbit. Then once you're there, if you're not at the right altitude, let's say you need to go lower or higher, you need propulsion to raise your orbit or change it to a lower altitude. You'll need propulsion if you want to change the angle of your orbit so that you can reach different countries and fly over different countries. And once you're up there, things like drag or the fact that the Earth is not perfectly uniform in its gravitational field, or the fact that the sun has solar winds hitting your satellite all the time, mean that you need to account for little perturbations. And then finally, if you want to leave the Earth and fly somewhere else, you need a lot more propulsion. So all those little orange arrows that popped up are here to represent uh, that one part of the equation, what we call delta V, the amount of velocity change that you need to do in order to achieve these missions. The more that you need to do once you're in space, the larger that number gets. When we think about rocket propulsion, we generally think of a long history of launch vehicles, things that take us from the ground into space. This has all been traditionally achieved with what we call chemical propulsion. And we've come a long way with it. We can do a lot of amazing things. Um, and it's different from ion propulsion. And it's large. You can't really make chemical propulsion systems that give you really large velocity changes fit onto a vehicle that fits in the palm of your hand. You can put it on there, certainly, but you can't get a lot out of it. So what happens when you don't have that on your satellite? Well, you can't do those things with a small satellite, like maintain your orbit, uh, go to different places. You're kind of stuck where you are, and you're stuck continuously falling out of the sky. So if you're trying to start a business around having an asset in space that's earning money every day, it doesn't really work if it's not able to do its mission, because it can't stay where it needs to be, or even get there, and it doesn't help that it falls out of the sky two, three years sooner than its value could be achieved. So how can ion propulsion solve this problem? This is a picture of what's called a Hall Effect thruster. This one is a six kilowatt version made at NASA. Um, and it's what I think is going to be the next big thing in satellites. So let's talk about the difference between chemical and ion propulsion. So with chemical propulsion, you're doing a chemical reaction. Let's say we take hydrogen and oxygen, we combust them, and so we're going to get water, very hot water, so steam, and then we expand that out of a nozzle, and we get a very high velocity exhaust. That's that other V in the equation that I was mentioning. This is exactly what's happening, this reaction, on the space shuttle main engine. So this is something that we're all familiar with. Now that velocity coming out the back is three and a half kilometers per second. That's really high. You know, we can't imagine our bodies ever traveling at that speed reasonably. Um, and that high velocity exhaust is what's giving us a push to go into space. So let's talk about ion propulsion. Now let's just assume that we could take that exact same water molecule, but it's not steam, it's nice and cold, and we were to instead ionize it. So now we have a positive water molecule. If we put that in the presence of a high voltage, we can accelerate it. So let's assume 300 volts. So we've accelerated this water molecule. How fast is this now going? In an ion engine that uses water and 300 volts, you'll get something like 15 to 16 times more velocity out of just that small voltage. And this system can be made very, very small in comparison to a chemical engine. So what difference does this difference in velocity make? Well, this is where we go back to our equation. So the comparison between the velocity coming out and how much velocity you need to achieve your mission will dictate how big your rocket needs to be, how wasteful will it be. So this is the Saturn V that took people to the moon. Just to get the 57 tons of people and equipment into orbit in order to go to the moon, it took 2.9 kilotons of equipment and propellant. That means that 98% of this rocket never went to the moon. 98% of what they put on the launch pad just got used up. That's a lot of waste. So let's say we're going from the Earth to Mars. Let's say we want to send food to some people who are colonizing. The change in velocity you need to go from Earth to Mars is about 11 kilometers per second. So with a chemical propulsion system, this means 95% of what we're building on the launch pad is never going to Mars. 
if we use an ion engine system, 17% never goes to Mars, a huge savings. But this doesn't really capture it very well. So let's do an example. We want to send one ton of wheat or rice or water to people on Mars. With chemical propulsion, it's going to take 20 tons of propellant. So we send it all over, so one ton makes it. If we were to instead use ion propulsion, it would take 0.2 tons of propellant, and we can send everything over. The difference that we're talking about here is two orders of magnitude. So for the same amount of money or things that we're putting on the launch pad, we can send 100 times more resources to Mars or wherever. It doesn't matter how far you're going, this relationship still holds. So ion propulsion is clearly going to be important for things like shipping cargo around, but what we need is to fit it onto these small satellites so that they're not 95% propellant once they're up in space. But there's another problem. This engine is still too big to fit onto a small satellite. Since the 1950s, people have been researching ion propulsion technology, and they've really done a great job. They've made amazingly efficient and effective engines. Um, Anita was just talking at the beginning of her presentation about some work that she did on an engine that helped the Dawn mission, uh, a flagship mission for NASA um, going out to asteroids. But it's still too big for our, our handheld satellite. So when I was in grad school at MIT, uh, I met my co-founder and we both worked on a technology there that is a new type of ion propulsion. It's been, as a phenomenon, known about since the 1500s, really, but researched in the last century, and then thought of as a propulsion technology also since about the 1960s. But no one could ever make something small enough, and satellites were never really small enough for it to make sense. The technology is called electrospray, and at Axion Systems, we're commercializing the developments that we uh, made at the MIT Space Propulsion Lab into uh, the technology that we're selling today. So not only in the palm of your hand, but between your fingertips, you can hold an ion engine now. Inside this chip, which is about the size of a coin, are 500 ion emitters. So we could even make a system that's smaller than this. Practically, we haven't had much reason to, um, but we now have coin-sized ion propulsion, which means we can fit it onto a small spacecraft because it's compact. But not only is it compact, it's extremely lightweight. So instead of having a chamber in which we're creating a plasma, we're using an ionic liquid salt. It's already ionized. Much like the salt that's here on the stage, it's already ionized in its chemical form, and it just happens to be a liquid. And we can attach that uh, chip to a tank that holds that propellant, and we can attach that to electronics that generate a high voltage and acceler accelerate those ions out to create the propulsion in a much smaller space, much lighter space than has been done before. And it's efficient. Um, this type of ion propulsion, electrospray, is mathematically uh, the most efficient propulsion uh, known to mankind that is not science fiction still. Um, so we're able to achieve efficiencies definitely above 50%, achieving maybe even 85 or 90% efficient in the amount of solar ener energy used to move the spacecraft around. And it's modular. We can put more than one chip on a system. We can put more than one of these systems onto a satellite. So regardless of whether your satellite needs a little bit of thrust or a huge amount of thrust, we can design a system just like Lego. Attach more of them, and you get more of what you want. Rather than the traditional method of taking an ion propulsion system and designing it exactly for one specific use case, and then having to either uh, arrange those creatively for a larger satellite or redesign the whole thing from scratch. We can just add more, quite simply. And we're using traditional microfabrication techniques developed by the integrated circuit industry, the MEMS industry, to build these. So we're also able to make them very cheaply. So what that means is that this revolution that is occurring in satellites to make them much smaller now has an equivalent propulsion technology that is just as small, just as scalable, and very importantly, uh, economical. Because when you're making 9,000 satellites, each propulsion system can't cost $10 million. 
No one's going to be able to close their business model with that. So whether we are talking about what's going on right now around Earth with imaging and communications and how we're shifting from the old model of just a few large satellites to what the uh, defense industry is adopting, what new telecommunications companies are doing, and what even the largest aerospace companies in the world are now pursuing, small satellites, or we're talking about setting up communications or bases uh, of exploration and development on the moon, or even shipping large amounts of um, equipment, people, resources to Mars so that we can start uh, expanding beyond the planet that we're currently on and, and begin developing what you know, I see as the future of humanity, a multi-planet species, we're going to need efficient propulsion. And I think that no matter what, ion propulsion is the way to go, and I think that the scalable technology that my company is developing is extremely compelling for doing so. So with that, I want to say thank you again to everyone here today, uh, and as well to Hello Tomorrow, and I hope you all enjoy your time here in Paris. Thank you.